Well, good morning, Family Church. Glad you could join me as we continue on our grace series called Unearned. And uh, when I grew up, I was uh, a little kid. I loved artwork. I loved painting and drawing. And I used to work uh, at a print shop and doing T-shirts and, and then signs for businesses. Um, and then I went into college and I was looking at uh, graphic design. So I've always been fascinated and enjoyed art itself. But the one area I never got involved in was sculpture. And so when I look at a sculpture like from Michelangelo, that he would take a full stone, a big hunkin' piece of stone, marble or some rock, and then carve out of that an image like this in one solid piece, it just blows my mind. Because you see things like 3D printers today and lasers that can carve and cut, but this is a guy with a bunch of hand tools by hand, and out of the stone emerges really an amazing figure. In fact, one of the quotes from Michelangelo, he said this, he said, every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it's the task of the sculptor to discover it. It's the task of the sculptor. And in the course of this so far in our unearned series, I think it's important that we, we set the stage of this depth of God's grace that we're understanding. And we started off with this idea that God is so uh, passionate about loving us that grace is a natural outflow of what God's character is. He just lavishes his grace on us. And Pastor Jason started our series with that. And then a few weeks ago, I talked about God's common grace, how he allows the sun and the rain to, to fall and to shine on the good and the evil. That he does that to, to extend his grace to all people with the hope that they might come to him. And then Pastor Drew, he, he walked us through saving grace, that moment in time where Jesus came, died on the cross, rose again, defeating death and sin, and offered that for you and me, the opportunity to receive saving grace. And last week, Pastor Jason just knocked it out of the park of really driving down into the identity of Christ, that we hold Christ's identity. And it's such a powerful message. If you've missed any of this, I encourage you to go back and get caught up. And because all of that drives us into today's topic. As we look deeper at grace, I have to start somewhere because the, the grace moment that we're going to be walking through or the grace perspective really starts here in Luke. It says this, that if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, Speaking of you and me, we love to give gifts to our kids. It says, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And I want to talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit, the grace of the Holy Spirit. But there's a, a work that the Spirit wants to do in you and me as followers of Jesus. And that work we refer to as sanctifying grace. And so today we're going to be looking deeply at what sanctifying grace is and how the Holy Spirit works through us and with us. And uh, we continue to put this idea down that, that you don't outgrow grace. Um, the saving grace moment in your life as a Christ follower was not the end of God's grace in your life. In fact, the second part of this, you don't outgrow grace. In fact, grace is how you grow. And this message today, sanctifying grace, is, is, in my opinion, the message of the work that God is doing, the grace he extends over us daily and in us by the Holy Spirit to grow us into his image. And so this is an important topic we're going to get into today. Um, I want to just lay the stage a little bit. Sanctifying that word or sanctification is the idea that once you're in Christ, you have been set apart. You have been set apart and made holy. And we talked last week about the identity in Christ that you were seated in the heavenly realms. I think this is a, a critical piece for us to understand because what I want you to hear today is that God is not making you who you will be someday. That's not what he's doing. This sanctifying process is not making you who you will be someday, but in fact, he's transforming you into who you already are. See, if you're already placed in the heavenly realms, if you're already a citizen of heaven, if you're already adopted as a son or a daughter of God, he then says, I'm not content to just redeem you. In fact, I'm going to transform you into who you already are. And that's the process we're going to walk through today, looking at sanctification. 
So if you want to open up uh, to the book of Colossians with me, I'm going to read to you. And I'm not going to put it on the screen right now. So if you don't have your Bible or an app where you can look at that, um, just listen. I just want you to hear the Word of God as the, as, uh, the Apostle Paul lays a groundwork for our topic today. So starting in verse 1 in chapter 1 in Colossians, the Apostle Paul um, of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, and now to us as well today, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring up from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of our, your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will, through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you will live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of His holy people in the kingdom of light. For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of his son he loves, in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. It's a fast flyover reading of a powerful message and a powerful passage that I believe directs us right into this moment today where I want to walk you through the heart of God and what he is trying and dearly desiring to accomplish in you as a follower of Christ and calling others into uh, receive the gift of grace the gift of salvation, but then to walk with him in a journey. And so I want to go ahead and let's look at the text a little closer and let's pull out some points that I believe um, really stand out to me. But also, if you understand this idea of sanctification or sanctifying grace, there's lots of books written on this. So we're going to take a lot of information and distill it into just a few real clear, I believe, uh, key concepts in the, cons in, the, in the construct of sanctifying grace. So let's look at the, te the text here. It says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before the world of truth, the gospel. And we start here with this key concept that your faith in Christ is what is redeeming you. It has redeemed you, your faith. In fact, we talked last week that God is pleased with you if you are in Christ. So as you're going to read this idea that your faith in Christ is what pleases God. And when he sees you as a child, he smiles when he thinks of you. If you are in Christ, he smiles. And he lavishes this on you and says, hey, there's a hope for you laid up in heaven. You've been seated in heaven. You're a citizen of heaven. And this, this hope is here for you. So, so use that to be encouraged, to continue in your journey as you pursue God. And then it says, this gospel which has come to you, as indeed the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing. The gospel is, is expanding. As it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth just as you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. In this first piece, I want you to understand the key concept that starts off the sanctifying grace. And so we'll start here with an inward transformation. So the first thing I want you to know is there is an inward transformation that took place. The moment that you said yes to Jesus, that you, you called upon in repentance and sincerity, said, I, I trust in you, I trust you for my life. I trust you, God, that you are in the, the a moment that happens, you are transformed. And we read through scripture uh, topic, topics and concepts 
Um, we hear scriptures that tells us that you're a new creation, that at that moment, the old is gone and the new has come. That, that no longer are you who you were. You are now placed in the, in the heavenly realms. Uh, we've learned, of course, that this is that moment, that inward transformation, when the, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you and you receive a new identity. Um, as I talked about, you've been set apart. You've been redeemed. You've been, you've been given uh, this adoption picture of now grafted into God's family. And the word that we often use at this, this key moment is justification. It basically just says that, that you're made righteous in, the, in God's sight when you're in Christ. So when he sees you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. It's a powerful, powerful moment. And we can't just race away from that. What we have to understand is, if you look at this picture, um, this is, you know, marble. And this, this idea, they take a big chunk and they set it apart. I just think that to me, it just makes sense that they, they grab this stone and Michelangelo said, look, in that stone, is, there's a statue waiting. There's an image in there. And God grabs us from amongst the masses, places us in the seat, seats us in the heavenly realms and begins to say, now it's time. I want to do something in you that I have planned since before time began. I want to do a good work in you and I want to do a good work through you. And so this inward transformation is this, this moment in time. And then God says, and now let's begin a journey together. And so as we go into the, the passage, we look at the next piece. It says, and so from the day we heard, you have not ceased, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. See, once we are filled with the Spirit, once we have been placed in heaven, our identity is secure and sealed with Christ, then he says, now that we are asking and praying that you would be filled. And this process that I want to walk you through is this idea of an outward validation. So, so the inward work happens, and then God says, now we're going to work on it so that you begin to see this emerge actually in your life. And so some of you are familiar with the fruit of the Spirit. And Galatians 5 is where you can go find that. But, but I want you to think about these words. See, these words are ones that don't come natural to us. These are, these are attributes of the Spirit of God in us that we begin to exude on the outside. So here they are, the fruit of the Spirit. We have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so I, I ask the question, when you evaluate your life, if you've been in Christ, if you've been following Christ, whether it's a, a day, a week, a month, or 40 years, are you experiencing the outward validation of the Spirit of God working in you? How's your love for others? How's your gentleness? Are you struggling with gentleness? Is there some work that you need to do with the Spirit in this? Is there some repentance, perhaps? How about your peace? Are you the, the kind of person that when you walk in the room, people go, wow, there, there's something about that person. There's, there's a light about that person that, that when they enter the room, I, I can't explain it, but, but they're a person of peace and, and I'm drawn to that. See, I believe that is the outward validation. And much like the sculptor, God chisels away at us removing the, the old self, even though it's all gone, he says, yeah, but there's this remnant. There's this remnant of you that you're going to wrestle with and I'm going to chisel away and work on you and with you so I can work through you. So that you would see an outward validation. And so if you've been coming to Family Church for a while, you're probably familiar with our spiritual pathway. And if not, I just want to lay the framework for this. I think this is an important uh, tool that we have. And that it's just a, it's a picture of the sanctifying grace that God wants to do. And so we have kind of our four categories. You have your seeker, um, your student, your servant, and your steward. And the basic idea was a seeker is dead and, and far from God. And they're dead in their sins and transgressions. But then there's this powerful moment we've talked about where, where the Spirit comes into and you become a, a new creation. And then we talk about you as being a, a, sir, a student, a stu, student, sorry. 
But as a student, the problem with a student phase sometimes is it's not about how long you've been sitting in church. It's that you haven't really fully captured and grasped the identity that you've received. And so you wrestle with that. And, and you wrestle with that true identity of who you are. And oftentimes, I think that's where we find most of our students get stuck. Is they, they don't maybe accept full forgiveness from God or all of God's love, or they struggle to really accept the fact that they've been redeemed, like truly been redeemed. And of course, as you walk down the path, here's the danger of, of something like this. And we've talked about this before, but I want to bring this back to light. The transition that happens from somebody who's far from God, who's dead in their sin, into somebody who's now redeemed by God is the work of the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who is at work, who opens our eyes, who, who allows us to, to understand what God is presenting to us. And the other part is that each one of these arrows or the transformation that happens is all a part of God's plan in our life, and it's all Spirit work. See, oftentimes what happens is people gravitate to things like this and they go, oh, finally, there's a plan that I can follow and do a bunch of things so that I could be more like God. And there's kind of the two pitfalls here. We have the couch and the treadmill. So those who maybe look at this and they, they, they understand perhaps the spirit of God desiring to work in them, so they go to the couch and they say, all right, I'm now in Christ, and man, I got it. I'm going to heaven. Thank you, God, for that. And now I can't wait to see what you do, and I go to the couch, and I sit down, and I hang out, and I wait, and I wait, and I, I expect you to do something great. And God says, yeah, it doesn't quite work that way. You see, there's, there's a work we're going to need to do together. In fact, there's these things called obedience, and, and there's lots of pieces that, that I'm going to call you to surrender and repentance and, and uh, to seek forgiveness of others. And there's a lot of things that I want to work with you on. So the couch idea doesn't work so well. Because if you just sit on the couch, it's going to be really hard to move forward. It's stationary. But then there's the other danger. There's the treadmill. And some people look at this and they go, oh, finally, this makes sense. I'll get on the treadmill and I'll read my Bible and I'll serve and I'll give and I'll, I'll help people and I'll love people and I'll attend church regularly. I'll do all of these wonderful works. Thank you. I'm so glad that now, oh, so a steward is somebody who gives graciously with their money. Good, I can do that. A steward is somebody who, who every day gets up and begins with prayer. God, help me. Oh, I can do that. And then they forget that all of this work is all the Holy Spirit work. That yes, we're to read our God's word. Yes, we're to be in prayer. Of course, we're to be giving generously, but that's in cooperation with the Spirit of God. And the funny part about the spiritual pathway is you can't look forward and say, I can't wait till I'm like that. Because that's the work the Spirit does with you. But you can look back and say, look at where I've come from. Look where I've come from. I'm, I'm amazed at what God is doing. And it reminds me of uh, kind of my, a little bit of my spiritual journey. When, when I came to faith 25 years ago, when I really truly understood who Jesus was, I can remember this awkward moment in my spiritual walk where I went and I put some music on that was some of my favorite music. Uh, and uh, I can remember sitting there going, wow, I used to love this and now I'm concerned. <laughs> In fact, a little bit of my history is that I grew up uh, kind of a heavy metal guy. I love, I love heavy rock music, right? So some of you uh, are old enough or are familiar with bands enough. So I was into, you know, Slayer and Megadeth and just heavy music, oftentimes, which was definitely not focused on anything that God would love for me to be listening to. In fact, if I really reflect on it, it was as if the music I listened to was showering me with darkness and death as opposed to life-giving light. And I can remember that moment. It wasn't like I set out that morning and said, well, I've been baptized and following Jesus. It's time to clean out all the CDs. It was that weird moment where I sat down and I went, whoa, whoa, I don't like what you just said there. I don't, what is going on? There was, there was a work happening. Now, I still like heavy music, and it's hard sometimes because I know that it's not profitable for me. And so I resist to listen to a lot of the things, not because if it's a legal aspect where, oh, if I listen to that, God's displeased. That's not the heart at all. The heart was that inside of me, 
I realized that this wasn't good for me. It also wasn't pleasing. I wasn't walking in a way pleasing to the Lord. And I think that's one example of this idea of the sanctifying grace that God has given. He didn't come in and say, well, you're now a child of God. Congratulations. Here's the to-do list. Or here's the things you can and can't do. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. Let's go on a journey together. And I'm going to chisel on you. And I'm going to work in you. And I'm going to shape you into the image that you already are. I'm going to work this out in you. In fact, this is a, an example, I think, if you evaluate your life, hopefully you're seeing this play out, not just in music, but maybe um, in entertainment in general, how you spend your money, how you treat your family, how you lead your coworkers or work under your leadership. This should be a, a, an implication of outward validation of the Spirit of God at work in you as you work with Him. And I, I think of it like this idea, rather than a couch where I sit, and expect the Spirit to do all the work, or a treadmill where I do all the work expecting the Spirit to approve everything. It's as if I believe that God says, tell you what, how about I carry you? And he picks me up and he says, let's get to work together. And there are times where he says, I need you to, to step in and do something here. And there are times where he says, look at what I'm doing. And together, he transforms us and shapes us. The next place I want to take you into is verse 10. It says um, this idea so that as we're being transformed and the Spirit enters in, it's so, so we could walk in a matter worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This, don't miss this. This idea that fully pleasing to Him isn't working to please God. It's doing the work with God that's pleasing to Him. See, when you're doing spirit work, you're doing kingdom work. And why wouldn't God just smile and lavish over you? But the temptation at that moment, as I just said that for some of you, is you said, oh, he's not pleased with me because maybe I'm not doing good works. We're trying to push that and resist that, that temptation. God is pleased with you if you're in Christ because he sees Christ in you. Don't forget that. This is an important piece that our flesh is so quickly wanting to be critical instead of accepting of what God is doing. But this idea is that we are bearing fruit in every good work. That as we do the work God has placed in front of us, as we work in cooperation with the Spirit, we bear good fruit. And we're being strengthened in all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. And Mitt, did you see what I just highlighted there? Did you see that? It says, according to his glorious might, that you're being strengthened, transformed. You're being shaped and molded into the image you already are, into who you are in Christ. But it's all according to his glorious might. And so this last kind of point I wanted to bring up is the whole purpose of this is that you might be a living representation. A living representation. See, the, the statue that the, the carver uh, extracts from the rock then gets put on display. And depending on what it is, it's a representation of the image that that, that carver saw in that stone. And just, I marvel at that idea to, to look at a big chunk of rock to carve out of it the image that, that they saw, that they see. And I think God uses that idea with us and says, I already see who you are, and I'm going to work. And now I want you to be a living representation. What does that ultimately mean? It means that when you go into the world, not only are you inwardly transformed, not only are you experiencing personally the fruit of the Spirit, the transformation, the transforming work of God in you, the sanctifying process, the evidence of, of joy and peace, you're experiencing it, but then finally, those around you see you as a living representation of your creator, the living representation of your savior, so that the good works you do don't draw attention to you. They're meant to draw attention to the one who redeemed you. They're meant to highlight the savior who's transforming you. Those are the living representations that when you enter the room, people are compelled by 
drawn to and wanting to know more about who it is that you serve and who you love. And so that to make the point, you are God's work on display. You are God's handiwork on display. It's such a critical piece. And in all of this, as we watch this unfold, this is what I want you to think about the rest of the passage where it says, all of this we give thanks to the Father who qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. That it's God who's pleased. That as you go through the process, you begin to experience true joy. And in that process, we give thanks to the Father. For he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we received redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, God is at work in you. And in the inward transformation that you received at that moment of salvation, you're called to serve with God in this process and hopefully you're experiencing an outward validation. You, you look back and you go, wow, look at what God is doing. Look at, why is it that today I love this person? I didn't love them at one point. That's, that to me is an outward validation of God at work. And then finally, that you're on display for all to see. And I, I can't help but finish up this topic with, with one last scripture from Philippians. That you and I, being confident of this, that he... God, who began a good work in you, will carry it on to the, the, excuse me, onto completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That moment when you enter heaven, when, when that final earthly breath is over and the completion of all of the sanctifying works and you find yourself now fully in his presence, fully in your new resting place, fully experiencing what it means to be a citizen of heaven. And God promises that from the day you're redeemed until your last earthly breath, he will work with you and work on you so he can work through you. Remember, this is so important. Please don't leave without this thought. God is not here to make you into somebody you will be. He is transforming you into somebody who you already are. You're a citizen of heaven if you're in Christ. Well, thank you for sticking around and walking through the, the sanctifying grace of God. And man, it's, it goes so fast. The time just flies for me when I'm, when I'm sharing God's word and really looking at these key concepts. So here's what I want you to leave with today. I think this would be an important moment. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus, I would encourage you to go and watch these videos again on God's grace. Um, this unearned idea, this thing that, that says Jesus died and rose again and provides us with an opportunity of redemption. That gift of grace is extended to you and that grace carries us until our last earthly breath. So here's my challenge for you for today is that you would make a list of where you're being transformed. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Christ, I have a challenge for you. Make a list of where you wish you were being transformed. Do you ever wish you had more peace in your life or more joy or experienced more love? Make a list of those things. But if you have been transformed by Christ, if you have been redeemed and have found yourself as a follower of Jesus rooted in Christ, I encourage you to make a list of where you've been transformed and where you are being transformed. And on your notes, there's actually a list of identities that you could look through and go, oh yeah, that's a new identity. I realized that was not me and today it is. But I encourage you to make that list and then spend the week, not only as you read in scripture, but just thanking God for all of these ways that he is transforming you into who you already are as a citizen of heaven. Of course, I want to keep challenging you to begin your day with prayer to look and to listen around you, to find out who's in need of, of the spiritual conversation, who's asking questions about their identity. And then, of course, eating. The easiest way to get involved is, hey, you want to come over and eat something together? Or, hey, want to have a cup of coffee? I'd love to, to share with you and just get to know you. So I encourage you to be a blessing to your community. Uh, let's take a minute. I'd like to just pray over you as you're, wherever you're watching from. Let's just pray together. Yeah, Father God, we thank you so much for sanctifying grace, that grace that you extend to us, that you, you lavish us with, that you promise in the redemption to carry us and change us into who we already are. God, thank you for that amazing gift. 
I pray for each person watching today that they would begin to accept and receive, to begin to experience and to live out what it means to truly be in Christ. Thank you for your grace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me. Looking forward to seeing you in the weeks to come.